was customary to sacrifice the Passover lamb, Jesus' disciples asked him, where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples telling them, go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Say to the owner of the house he entered, the teacher asked, where is my guest room, and where may I eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. The disciples left, went into the city, and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared for the Passover. May God add his blessing for the reading out of Mark 14. Here is the you may be seated. Well, now we're moving towards the climax as things have been set in motion on Wednesday. Last week we talked about Wednesday. Judas has made his deal, and now Thursday is going to unfold. And Jesus has been anointed for burial, remember, by the unnamed woman who took the extensive ointment and put it on Jesus' head. So he is ready for his burial. And one of those closest to him, one of the twelve, will betray him. And so this day, for Christians, liturgically is called Monday Thursday. And we'll talk about why that is true. But this becomes, or begins really, the solemn part of this season. Really, we don't talk a lot about Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in, in our worship services, but Thursday, Monday, Thursday is typically a, an event or a service that is held in many, many churches. But Thursday, Monday, Thursday, is full of a lot of drama. There's going to be a lot happening on this day. Jesus eats his final meal with his 12 disciples. He prays for the deliverance in Gethsemane. He's betrayed by Judas. He's denied by Peter. He's abandoned by the disciples. He's arrested in darkness, interrogated, and condemned to death. What a day. You thought you were busy. There's a lot going on in Jesus' life on that Thursday. And this all happens to him before daybreak on Friday. These are the events of Thursday. We've been following Mark's narrative on these events. That's the gospel that we've chosen to follow. And so when we come in next Sunday and talk about Good Friday, it will actually be at dawn. Dawn on Good Friday morning. And Jesus will be transferred from the Sanhedrin, or the Jewish trial. He'll be transferred to the Roman government. If we look at this story from a different gospel, though, if we were to look at this story from the Gospel of John, we're going to find out right away that the dating is different. And so it's not the same. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke have the disciples sharing the Passover meal together. They write that story the same way. But in John, it's not that way. Thursday is the day before Passover. So the Passover meal would actually be on Friday. Sundown Friday is when Passover is actually celebrated. The Passover lambs would be killed on Friday afternoon in preparation for that meal on Friday evening. And John does that because he it tries to be liturgically sound. He recognizes that Jesus is the new Passover lamb. And so he's, he has this time that Jesus is devoted to the disciples. And what does John talk about on Thursday? Foot washing. And so we get the story of the foot washing. And so in Mark, Mark gives us nine verses on this Passover meal. Nine verses. How about John? Five chapters. In fact, in John, it's called Jesus' Farewell Discourse. Chapters 13 through 17 of John are about the Passover and foot washing and what happened. So the gatherings in these, in these Gospels are very different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, synoptic Gospels, they knew Mark was written first, Luke and Mark, uh, Matthew and Luke read that and wrote theirs after that. So they have a little more depth, but they follow the same story of Mark. John, written later, is much, much different, even has different days. And so in John is where we get the the words that we use at Holy Communion, the Sacrament of Holy Communion, we get those. 
word. But John has the story, I'm sorry, in Mark we get the word. John says nothing about those words of Holy Communion. John talks all about the foot washing, the disciples' feet. And in fact, John is the gospel where we get the word Monday. Monday, Thursday comes from the gospel of John. And why? Well, because that's the night that Jesus gave them the final command. Remember John 13, 34. Love as I have loved you. Here's how it's spoken. I give to you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should love one another. Monday means commandment. So on that Thursday, they get a new commandment. Monday, Thursday. Mark's preparation comes in what I read. Go find a place for the Passover. I sing a man with a jar and he'll have a room ready. It also reminds us of what Jesus said when he needed the donkey. Go into town, there'll be a donkey tied there. Go and get the donkey. And if someone asks you why, say the master needs it. All that happened. Somebody said, what are you doing taking that donkey? So the master needs it. Getting that donkey. Like, hey. Same with this. Go find a man with a jar. You need a room for the Passover. Okay, it's ready. It's ready. It's ready. It's ready. You get to, uh, on the tour of Israel, you get to spend time in an upper room. On the location, they believe the upper room happened. Now, it's not the upper room. Very decorated, and very nice, but it's supposed to be on the place where the upper room happens. So you can get a surreal feeling if you, if you put yourself back in the first century of the kind of in the spot where But we know there was a couple of things happening that week, wasn't it? Here we have Jesus going into town on a donkey in this non imperial way. In, in the Jerusalem, no violence, in fact, cheer. And on the other side, we have this very imperial power, this showing of force with Roman soldiers coming into town because of crowd control. Busiest time of year in Jerusalem was the Passover, and so they needed extra soldiers to come in. But the upper room is a meeting of secrecy. Jesus didn't want everybody knowing where they were going to celebrate the Passover. Because he knew one among them was going to be him. And so he didn't want Judas to do anything to mess up his last meal, last supper, last time being with his friends, his disciples. And so he does it in secret. He sends two disciples into town to prep for it. And so Judas doesn't know exactly when and where it's going to be because he wasn't one of the two that went but Jesus must have known, must have felt that things were coming to an end. Not because he was in touch with God and God had told him this is the day, but because of the actions that were going on in the society around him. The things that were happening. The way that people were plotting. And so this happening, Jesus had the sense that this was going to be the time of his end to his earthly life. Well, what was Jesus' meal practice? We know that Jesus did a lot of ministering over food. Ministers today call it the night and fourth ministry. A lot of action takes place in churches over meals. A lot of meetings, we have a meal. A lot of individual one-on-ones are at a restaurant over a meal. And Jesus taught parables, and he taught all kinds of people, all kinds of people, over so people wondered if Jesus went to all this trouble to have a meal with people, why did he meet with such undesirables? Why was it Jesus was always with the difficult, the ones that were outcasts? And maybe this is a sentence that we can bring into our own lives. Jesus practiced inclusion in a society that held sharp social boundaries. We have that. We have people we don't like to be around or associate with or be in the company of, have in our car, invite to our homes. We have those. Think about it. There's probably some coming to mind. We all have them. Pastor has them. But we're supposed to include, we're supposed to be inclusive. That's who we are as believers. But Jesus had deals for religious and political significance. 
The religious because it was done in the name of the kingdom of God. Political because he had, he was affirming a vision for a very different society. Our comparison may be, an easy one maybe, the anti-segregation legislation that went on in the South in the 60s. We had a kingdom of God that was preached from pulpits throughout the South about a divided kingdom. So these foods were not just ritual. Jesus enjoyed meals. He enjoyed the eating and the drinking and the talking and the teaching and the fellowship of a meal. Not unlike our first Sunday covered dish. And those of you who don't go to cover dish, I hope you go out to eat with somebody that you can enjoy the conversation and the food and the fellowship of who you're with. I hope you don't choose to go home and be alone. We, we know that the Lord loved meals. Think about his practice of feeding the 5,000. What did he do? He blessed the bread and broke it and it multiplied. Bread was an important part of the meal. It symbolized the basis of existence. Give us our daily bread. It's in prayers that we use. It's important. And the Last Supper, the Last Supper actually echoes this food time of fellowship and with bread. And we also know that the Passover meal is a very important meal to the Jews. It tells them and reminds them about the birth of their nation. It reminds them of how they were released from bondage, they were delivered, and they were liberated. We may not feel that so much. We grew up, we were born liberated. But think of you were born into captivity. You were born into bondage. You were born where you couldn't leave where you were. You had to work where somebody told you to work. And you got paid what people got paid. You were, had no chance for advancement. And then all of a sudden, something happens and you're released from it. And you're able to have your own nation and your own thriving of, of being able to grow and enjoy. That's what the Jews were celebrating. And they still celebrate Passover. It's still a very important time. When does it happen? It happens during the 10th plague. Who remembers what the 10th plague was? It's and so it took that type of significant event for Pharaoh to finally relent and let the people go. Yet he had nine previous opportunities to let the Jews go. But it was the loss of his own son. Interesting. Probably not by accident. So we have this Passover meal, this Passover lamb that is going to be sacrificed in the Exodus. We have a Passover lamb that will be sacrificed on these coming days after the upper Passover meal was called a fate. And it reminds the Jews that the Exodus can be brought, brought into the present. So it's not just about the past, but it also is about the What we need to be reminded of is that on April 18th, we will have a Seder meal here at the Fellowship Hall. You all are invited to that. It's at 6 o'clock. It's an educational meal of how we can understand the Passover meal. It won't be a meal that you can eat and pull on. It's going to be an educational meal of what the Jews actually do at Passover. It will be done by a, a, son, a Messianic rabbi, John Fisher's And I invite you all to come out and learn and understand, because the more we understand the Jews, the better Christian you will be. Anybody that thinks they can be a Christian without understanding Israel, you're missing a lot about your history. And so you have to have a heart for Israel to be a good Christian. I invite you to be there. Well, after the meal, Jesus gathers his guys together. They have their meal. They sing a hymn. And I bet you they sung it with some they sang it where the angels enjoyed hearing. They sang together. And they departed from the upper room and they leave the city and they go 
go out through the temple gate, I can see it. Those of you that have been to Israel can see it. They go out through the temple gate, down to the Kidron Valley, up into the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not far. It would be like walking from here, across the street, through the cemetery, to some of the beautiful homes. And they're singing and they're walking and they're, 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 they're sensing that something's going on. But they're celebrating Passover. They're celebrating that their bodies are released, a new nation. They've been delivered. They've been liberated. If you've been liberated and delivered, aren't you enthusiastic? I think they were. Jesus tells them and gives them some news that brings their enthusiasm down. All of you will desert me tonight. What's Peter saying? I'll never desert you. And then he tells Peter, you will do more than that. You will deny you even know me. You won't just desert me. You will deny you even know me. Before the rooster crows, you will deny knowing me three times. Can you imagine hearing that? Can you imagine God coming to you, or Jesus coming to you, and sitting in your living room, and you're so happy to be with him. Gosh, you've been with him, he touches so much, you love being with him. And he says, you know, I'm going to be arrested tonight. No, and you're sitting there, and you're going, oh, I'm not going to let you be arrested. You're in my house. I won't let him in. Oh, it's going to be worse than that. Pastor Joe, you're going to, you're going to deny me. I will always know. Uh, listen, you're going to deny even knowing. Can you imagine how Peter felt? Well, then Jesus says to the to the top three, the, the troika of the leadership, Peter came to you can go with me, and then we'll pray. And they go with him. Of course, they'd be obedient to that. They go with him to pray. Jesus says, stay awake, stay alert. Something's happening tonight. You've got to be awake. Jesus goes to pray. He's in, he's in anguish. He throws himself to the ground. He's in such torment because of all the guilt and shame and sin that is laid on him. And what do the disciples do? They fall asleep. It's that important. Jesus comes back. Can't you stay awake? You know what I'm going through. Can't you stay away? Stay away. They see the anguish on him. He, Jesus doesn't hide that. He doesn't come back and say, it's going to be okay, guys. I'm going to take this into the whole world. It's okay. I got it. You know, I am Jesus. It's not like that. He actually bleeds from the capillaries in his head because the, the torment is so intense. Think about all the shame, grief, sin, that's heaped upon him from the past, the present, and the future. It's hard enough to handle our own guilt and shame, or our children's guilt and shame. And he handles all of our guilt and shame. Think of that, Sarah's group. By that time, the group has come to a rescue. It's interesting. When Jesus is pouring out his heart, to God, he doesn't use the terms that is normally used. Father. Mark was written in Greek. So if you were looking at the Greek Bible, you would find words in there that are of the Aramaic language. Which one? Abba. Jesus uses Abba here to be translated as Papa. I don't know how many of you called your father Papa. Or your grandfather, Abba. But Abba is meant to be the most intimate of words between Jesus and God. And there were others that used Abba in the first century, and those people that used it were said to have been some of the most intimate in relationship with God in all of Judea. They were great healers, and they were intimate with the Father. Jesus uses the word Abba. In fact, 
That word was used in the, in the human realm for toddlers talking to adults. Few people used it, Jesus uses it here. And it's written in Aramaic when they wrote, wrote the gospel in Greek. It's important. Jesus prays for deliverance. He prays that this hour may pass from him. And then he knows that he has to take this on because it's not his will, it's the Father's will. And so not my will be done, but your will be done. Jesus will do what the Father wants. Jesus died a martyr. <coughs> He handed himself over. From Peter to Paul to the outstanding apostolic ladies, Thecla and Perpetua, to Dietrich Bonhoeffer, to the nuns of El Salvador, this prayer is used throughout the world, Abba, Father. And it's not a resignation as much as it is a trusting in God in the midst of the circumstances. Those that are going to be martyred, those that are giving up their life for their faith, understand what it means to say, oh, well, We know at some point in the Passover meal, Judas leaves. In the Gospels, it varies as to when he leaves. He knows that the disciples are going to the Mount of Olives and to the Gethsemane. When Judas knows where they're going, he decides to leave. That's when he's going to let the authorities know where they can arrest Jesus. And the temple authorities have a, uh, it's not an army, but it might be a little bit bigger than a police force. The temple security goes with the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders, remember the authorities, to arrest Jesus. And many wonder why Judas had to kiss him. Wouldn't those people have known Jesus? Would they have known who they had to arrest? No mistakes here. The ultimate act of betrayal is to give somebody a kiss at the moment you are sending them to their death. It's about the power in that moment. In Luke and John, that story is much greater. The scripture says that Peter, when Jesus was arrested, drew his sword and cut the ear off of one of those arresting him. Now, the question would be, does that mean the disciples were armed? We asked that in Bible study on my night. And we came to the conclusion that probably at least some of them were armed to have a bit of security for themselves. And after all, they spent a lot of time out, away from people and, away, uh, and around things that could harm them. At the same time, we know that there was one among them was called Simon the Zealot. Zealots didn't negotiate very well. They took things into their own hand. We know Peter had a sword. Jesus says, put the sword away. Jesus heals the ear of the soldier that is harmed. Peter puts the sword away. Peter not. Judas betrayed. Peter is restored. In fact, all the disciples are restored except Judas. And Judas, had he stayed alive, not taken his own life, had he decided to come back and ask Jesus for forgiveness, he would have been restored as well. The person that kissed and betrayed and sold out the master would have been forgiven. All he had to do was ask. And you think you've done something wrong. Don't ever for a moment Think that you could do anything so bad and so heinous that Jesus would walk away from you, that God wouldn't forgive you. There is nothing, nothing, nothing. I know you're thinking about some things you've done. I know you're thinking about some, some actions you've taken, some decisions you've made, some things you didn't do that you ought to have done. None of that can prevent you from being restored to a relationship and community. Jesus is arrested. He's taken by the temple authorities back to the Sanhedrin, the chief priests, the elders, the scribes. This is called the Jewish trial of Jesus. He's taken back to a place 
where he's not knocked around, but he's put on trial. And probably a typical trial. I mean, they tried to have the right number of witnesses corroborate what they were saying so that they could pass judgment on it and it would be legal. They have trouble with that. Now, the problem we have is we don't have any disciples in there that wrote about this. We have to rely on leakers. There are a few of those people in government you know, that will leak things. Have you ever heard that? They actually will leak things. And that's true in that day. Where we get these stories from are from leakers that were there. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, well, they weren't there. So the leakers tell us, and, and people wrote it down. Remember that he is condemned. There are different people brought in front to offer witness, and they don't corroborate themselves. But they already made the decision. So it really wasn't a hearing as much as it was a deadly hearing. They were going to condemn him anyway. And in fact, anyway, in fact, the Sanhedrin, the leaders actually made their own of their own question because they weren't going to wait for this. It was brought into three stages. There was the testimony against Jesus, which, and a second testimony against Jesus, which neither of those matched. And then there was a verdict and the abuse. Stage one was witnesses disagree among themselves. There were accusations. They couldn't corroborate them between people. They had two different stories. And the Sanhedrin was upset. Stage two, Jesus is still silent. He hears the witnesses by the but the priest interrogates Jesus. The priest asks him questions. Are you the Messiah? Are you the Son of the Blessed One? That is, are you the Christ, the Son of God? And the questions coming from the high priest in that way mean they don't have any witnesses that show that Jesus is doing that. And then the last stage, there's an interchange between the, the authorities and Jesus has a response. Jesus said, you the Son of God, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated on the right hand and the power coming with the clouds of heaven. Jesus begins his affirmation with the word, I am. Matthew quotes this as, you have said so. Are you the Son of God? You have said so. Luke says, in the question, are you the Son of God? You say that I am. The high priest takes that as the affirmation. Jesus, after that, uses a lot of Son of God statements. This is Thursday. These events unfold. And as we read them, all the Peter's denials and Jesus' courage, people took sides on that. In fact, they imitated each of those. People imitated Peter's denial and Jesus' courage. Those who imitated Jesus, of course, we would applaud them. We would applaud them for their courage. Those who imitated Peter rather than Jesus, we may need to consult. We may need to feel like they needed hope for repentance and forgiveness. Who would you have been on that day? Would you have stood up for your faith? Would you have stood up with Jesus? Would you have stood up as he was beaten and tortured and knocked around? Yeah, I'm with him. You need to beat me and torture me, I'm with him. Is that who you would have been? Or would you have been with Peter? I know him. I don't think I can speak for him. Peter remembers his denying Jesus when the roots broke and he breaks down. And he probably, it says he wept. I'm guessing he cried so, so bitterly and so shameful like he had never cried in his life. The denials and the betrayals in Jesus' life on that on day 30, he was the worst sins against Jesus. People lost their faith. They were in despair when they made the sin they did. And maybe that's our greatest sin. The worst sin we may have is when we despair in our moment of trial. Instead of laying our life at Jesus' feet, we tend to walk and turn our back on Maybe our greatest sin is our despair, our loss of faith at the moment we need the greatest faith. Maybe our loss of sin is when we, we do sin, we don't ask for repentance. Because we know that every time we ask, we will obtain forgiveness. 
had Judas broken down and wept and asked for repentance and redemption, Judas would have been forgiven instantaneously. Peter reappears in Mark 16. Judas, Judas never reappears in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus is now convicted and sentenced. So next week we look at the Roman trial. Let me just tell you this. They take you to the spot where they believe the Sanhedrin passed judgment on Jesus. And after they pass judgment on Jesus, there is this hole. It's probably 10 feet deep, maybe 12 feet deep. Yeah, probably 12 feet deep. And there's a small opening big enough for a person to get through and slides down into that hole. Now that hole represents the cell that Jesus was held in on Monday, Thursday evening till dawn Friday morning when they get him out. And they threw him in there. Now, a surreal moment is when you're singing a hymn, understanding that your Savior was thrown into a hole like that. Maybe the same hole, maybe not. doesn't matter. It was in that area, and it was a hole 12 or 14 feet deep. And he was thrown into it after being condemned by the authorities, waiting for the Romans to put him to death. He knew what was coming. He was thrown into that hole. Now, a group of about 20 of us read Scripture sang a hymn in that hole. And I promised myself on that day that I would tell that story on this day when I did a sermon on Monday Thursday. I did not realize in my 60 years that that's what it was like for Jesus in front of the Sanhedrin. Because we, because I always skipped that trial and went right to Pilate. Arrested, yeah, the, the, the Jewish leaders passed him to Pilate. <coughs> Not realizing what Jesus went through before he got to Pilate. Of course, the denials and betrayals, we all know that. But what about the ridicule from the authorities? What about being thrown bodily into a hole, a dark, dank, damp, hell of a hole to hold your Savior in? for hours before he goes to Pilate. Think about that. He did that for you and for me. Because why? Because we're so great? Because we deserve it? Because we're white Americans? Is that why he did it? No. Because he loved you before you were even born. When you were in the womb, he was willing to take bruising and flogging and nailing for you. And he did the same for Peter and Judas. And they denied him and betrayed him. Who are you? Who are you on this day? On this Monday, Thursday? Who are you going to walk out of here and be? Are you one that's going to follow him through that walk, that journey, that difficult death? Are you going to walk with him in that? Or are you going to deny him? Or are you going to betray him? Or are you going to forget what he went through for you? experiences in our life that have brought us to you, those difficult times in our life when we, we don't witness properly, when we don't acknowledge you thoroughly. We are so thankful that we have those so we can rely on you, understanding that that's who we are, but understanding also that we come to you and you forgive us when we repent and we walk and try again. We're so thankful for the, the number of times you give us to try again. And so we pray that the, the people of Sylvan Abbey, the people that Sylvan Abbey comes across, witnesses to, enjoys meals with, buys their food from, buys their clothes from, goes to the car wash with, 
that they will understand who we are because of what you have done for us. That we won't hide that. We're believers in Jesus Christ. We just should be proud of that. We're going to acknowledge that. That's who we are. We're thankful that the Holy Spirit has gifted to us to constantly be there to help hold us up, hold our hand, give us a hug, walk with us, and to help us when we turn our back and turn back around. So that we can always be exactly who you want us to be. Believers in God the Father, Jesus the Son, and in the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Our final hymn is number five. Here I am. Here I am. Thank you.